I want to welcome you to our worship service on this second Sunday of the new year at the Big Cove Presbyterian Church here in Brownsboro, Alabama. My name is Mel Strain. I am filling in for Pastor Kim, which, as she'll be gone the next two weeks, though she'll be here for the annual congregational meeting, as I wanted to mention that for those that are online. That will take place next Sunday, and you can at least watch it through Zoom, and there'll be information going out this week for how that to take place, or you can email the church or call to get that information if you care to see and be a part of that meeting by Zoom. Let us worship God as we prepare for the call to worship. Good morning. Could you please uh, follow me with the call to worship? <clears throat> Come, let us worship our God who hears and answers our prayers. We, we enter this house of prayer knowing God forgives us when, when we confess our sins and helps us when we make known our petitions. We believe also that God hears all people when they pray to him, granting them forgiveness and help in response to their needs. Praise, Praise the, the Lord, for he is our God who is accessible to all who will come to him. Let's join in singing this hymn of praise. It's well known throughout the church, uh, throughout the world. It's holy, holy, holy. We will sing three stanzas of this great hymn. morning. Holy, holy, holy Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Whether here or online, we ask you to be with us. Lord, please give Pastor Mel the words that you would want him to say. And Lord, as he teaches us, please open our minds and our hearts that we may hear the words that you have for us that we may be filled and that we may be able to go out into the community and serve you Lord you are precious to us Lord and we praise you Amen Amen. One of my favorite hymns is the one that we just sang for our opening worship Holy 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 but it is well known throughout Christendom. And a lot of times in congregations when we sing that, because so many people know that, they sing it with a lot of enthusiasm and even gusto. 
But though it's good to come before God with hymns of praise and also with our words of adoration and praise, it's equally important that we come before God opening up ourselves to Him and sharing with Him our weaknesses, our sin, as well as our failings to live the full life that He has called us to live. So will you join with me as I share in prayer a prayer of confession? Father, it's good to sing hymns of praise to you and to share our words of praise. But we confess that we have also fallen short of any real and deep commitment to you. We know that Jesus was your son, yet we seldom acknowledge his rule in our lives. We have walked an easy road, not hearing your call to justice and to love. Carelessly, we've gone along with the way of others, and we've been overruled by our common desires. So we ask that you forgive us, O God, and draw us out of sin. Make us men and women who live to praise you and who love to obey the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is both King of the world and Head of the Church. Amen. And the word grace is a very good theological word. It refers to God's unmerited grace that we cannot earn, we cannot work for it, we cannot achieve it through even our good deeds. But it comes out of God's love for us and it comes freely. So all we can do is open our hearts and receive it. The gift of salvation, for instance, comes from God's grace. The gift of forgiveness comes also from God's grace. And as the writer of the epistle says, if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins, but even more than that, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just as we've had rain today, which we have no control over, and as it will rain this afternoon, so God pours out his grace freely upon us. Amen. Let's join together in that hymn, I Love You, Lord, and we'll sing it twice. as it is read to us from Isaiah. Okay. In the year of King Uzziah, uh, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were septrums, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling one another. Holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. For I am man unclean lips, and I lived among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken from with the thongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is a very familiar passage out of Matthew's Gospel. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount, and it pertains to prayer. Jesus said, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward. But whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Pray with me a moment. Father, we thank you for your word, which is to us a light in the midst of darkness. I ask that your spirit be present with us and that it speak to our hearts and to our minds and that we may not only hear your word, but be able to adapt it into our lives so that we can live more fully as your people. For I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. This morning I want to start a two-part series on the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer actually falls nicely into two parts. The first part has to deal with God and the glory of God and our relationship with God. The second part are three petitions for daily bread, for forgiveness, for deliverance from evil. And that, as I said, we'll look at next week, that second part. If you're like me, you learned the Lord's Prayer when you were quite young. In fact, you may not even remember you know, learning it, but I learned it, I'm sure, from my mother, and I learned it in Sunday school. In fact, we would always say it at the end of our time in Sunday school, and then we would say it in worship. And I grew up in the northwest corner of New Jersey, and it was a public school, and they don't do this anymore, but we would always begin each day with a reading from the Old Testament. Because we had some Jewish kids in school, we couldn't read from the New Testament. So it was usually one of the Psalms, and it was either the teacher or one of the students would read a Psalm, and then we would stand for the Lord's Prayer and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I can still remember, there were times that I would sit down and i think to myself, did we do the Lord's Prayer this morning and the Pledge of Allegiance? Because it was done by rote. We, we did it without even thinking about it. And so there were times I would scratch my head and thinking, gee, did we really do that this morning? Well, that can happen to any of us. We do it as a part of worship, and they just become words that we say without really giving much thought to what those words mean. I remember something that William Barclay wrote in his commentary on his passage, and he said that the Lord's Prayer is not really a child's prayer, because when you look at it, there's much that is not meaningful for a child. In fact, I would even go on to say that there's a lot there that's not meaningful for us as adults. If someone were to ask us, what does this part mean or what does that part mean, we may have a hard time in answering that question. Then he goes on to say that the Lord's Prayer is really a disciple's prayer. And only on the lips of a disciple does the Lord's Prayer really take on meaning. So let's look at that first part. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That little word our is an interesting one. Jesus could have said, pray to my Father who is in heaven. After all, he had a close relationship with the Father. And 
human language has its limitations, but he used that father-son analogy to refer to the closeness of relationship that Jesus had with the Father, even though Jesus is co-equal with God the Father. Now that little word, our, says that no one can claim exclusive rights to God. He doesn't belong to anyone, people, or any nation, or in any particular language, but anyone that wants to have a close relationship with God as our Heavenly Father is invited into this relationship with God. Now that our word, our, also means that we are children of God. We're brothers and sisters of Christ, so there's an obligation that we have when we say the Our Father, that we want to live as his children, as people of faith that God calls us to. That word Father is interesting too, because Jesus could have said, pray to the Divine One. Pray to the One who's creator of all. The One who sustains the universe. The One who is the Omnipotent One. But instead he uses the word Father which indicates the closeness of relationship that God wants each one of us to have with him. In fact, the Greek word there is Abba, which is probably closer to our translation of dad or daddy. Our daddy in heaven, who loves us and cares for us, and wants each one of us to have a close and personal and intimate relationship with him. And Jesus invites us to pray that our Father that closeness of relationship that he had that he wants each of us to have who aren't in heaven. Where's heaven? Up there somewhere? Out there somewhere? Well, maybe. But let me submit to you that heaven may be another dimension that exists all around us. We can't see it. We can't experience it with our five senses. Now this may sound squirrely, but does that mean that it doesn't exist in a spiritual realm that coexists with our world of sight and touch? When you look at heaven, by definition, it's the abode of God. It's where God dwells. So where does God dwell? Well, if God is omnipresent, he dwells everywhere. There is no place where God dwells is not. So it's not just out there somewhere, but God exists all around us. And our loved ones, when they pass on from this life to the eternal life, they may not go up there somewhere, but they may coexist with us. The writer of Hebrews talks about we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that are encouraging us, cheering us on, and that can bring us a lot of comfort that our loved ones are really with us, praying for us, encouraging us to live out all that it means to be God's people. The word in Hebrew for spirit is the word ruah, which means wind as well as spirit, but it also means breath, the breath of God. And God wants us to breathe, in a sense, his life, his breath, into our very being. And there's an exercise that some of you, I'm sure, have used. It's called spiritual breathing, where before you begin prayer, that you breathe the breath of God into you. Because God wants to dwell within us. That's the closeness that God wants to have with each and every one of us. We don't pray for a God that's out there, just out there but a God who dwells within us. We're not praying to ourselves, but we're praying to the breath of God, the Spirit of God that dwells within us. That's the kind of closeness that God wants to have with each and every one of us. A very close, a very intimate, a very personal relationship. If that's the kind of relationship you want, then by all means, pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, be thy name. I'll tell you, children have a hard time with hallowed. One youngster thought it was, hello, what be thy name? <laughs> or another child, Harold, be thy name. You know, I hope you know that the word hallowed means holy. Holy is thy name. I believe today that we've lost a sense of the holiness of God. 
know, that passage that was read to you from the Old Testament is one of my favorite passages where Isaiah is transported in this vision into the very presence of God and he hears the seraphs singing back and forth and they're like bouncing against the walls. Holy, holy, holy as the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of your glory. Why the repetition of the word holy? Why not just say holy is the Lord? Why holy, holy, holy? When I ask that question, people sometimes respond by saying, well, give it emphasis. Well, it does that. But the real reason is because in the Hebrew language, they had no way of expressing the superlative. They couldn't say holiest. So they would say holy, 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 meaning that God is more holy than anything or anyone in all of existence. What was Isaiah's response? Woe is me. And then literally what it says is, I am undone. I'm as good as dead. Because the belief was that us being unholy, being sinners, if we came into the very presence of God, we would be struck dead just like that. We've come a long ways from that, where we treat God's name in more of a frivolous way. In the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, the Hebrew people took that literally. They would not even pronounce God's name. Now, God took the name on himself, which literally means I am who I am. And in the King James, it's translated as Jehovah. More modern scholars feel that it was probably would have been translated Yahweh. And the truth is, we don't know because they never pronounced it. Whenever they were reading along in the text and they came across that name, I am who I am, they would substitute the name Adonai. Because they felt that by even pronouncing the name, I am who I am, is to bring it down on our level. And because we are sinful pe people, it would be to taint the very name of God. Whew. How we banter God's name back and forth today. We treat it in a very disrespectful, frivolent, even irreverent way. Oh my God! I, I hear that all the time. And sometimes they say they're trying to be funny about it. But we don't want people to mistreat our names. At least I don't. Nor do we want God, you know, God to have his name mistreated. But we need to treat it with the highest reverence and respect. Because the name represents the person. So it's not just the name being holy. The name represents the holiness of God. You know, the psalmist says it's a fearful thing to come into the presence of a holy God. And I think we've lost that sense of healthy respect and reverence. There's a healthy fear in a way because we're coming into the presence of a holy God. But the amazing thing is he doesn't judge us, but he wants to share his love, to share his blessings, to share his grace with us. That's the kind of relationship that God wants each of us to have with him. Thy kingdom come. How would you explain that? What is the kingdom of God about? Well, I've shared with this before, so some of you, if you were here, you may remember. You know, I've said there are three things that you need in order to have a kingdom. You need, first of all, to have a... You need a king. You can't have a kingdom without a kingdom. Secondly, you need... People. People willing to live under the rulership of the king. And then you need some kind of realm where the kingdom of God exists. Now, in ancient times, they had kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Persia, the kingdom of Assyria, the kingdom of Babylon. And these were, they had their king, they had people, and they tried to expand their territory so they could have more and more power over more and more people. So those are the three elements that we need in order to have a kingdom. So how do you get into the kingdom? Really, very simple. You invite Christ, who is the king, to come and live within you, to dwell within you. It's that simple. If you invite Christ to come, live in you, you're in the kingdom. If you've never done that, you're not in the kingdom.
So that's why I make no bones about emphasizing from time to time the importance of receiving Christ into our lives because that's how you get into the kingdom and that's how the kingdom gets into you. And the second part is when you have people like within this church that have the kingdom within them then we become a community of the king. And how we live and act and relate to one another is a reflection of what kingdom life is about. And you know this. We love one another as God loves us. We forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. We help one another. We pray for one another. We support one another. We strengthen one another. We are there for one another. There's a whole host of one another's in the New Testament. There's a negative side. We don't criticize one another. We don't belittle one another. We don't tear down one another. And when we have disagreements, we work for reconciliation and for harmony and come to some kind of resolution. Unfortunately, Christians don't do a good job when it comes to conflict. You all know that adage. You've never seen a fight until you've seen a church fight. You've never heard of that? I'll tell you, some church fights can get awfully nasty. And it shouldn't. We should be able to show others, to show the world, a better way of handling conflict and disagreements amongst us. And we need to work for harmony and peace and reconciliation. It's all there in the scriptures to how we are to do it. The problem is we fail to live out what it means to be kingdom people. So, receiving Christ into our life, being a community of the King and how we relate to one another. And the third aspect is we work for those things that are at the very heart of who God is. Our God is a God of peace. Our God is a God of justice. Our God is a God of righteousness. So those things that are at the heart of God are the very things that we work for in our community life together. Not only within ourselves, but out in society. We work for peace and harmony and reconciliation. We work for justice and fairness. And if people are mistreated, we are on the side of the disadvantaged, the downtrodden, those that are the less fortunate. And we work for things that are right. So we strive to right the wrongs of society. We may disagree on how that's to be done, but that's what God intends within his kingdom. Because when his kingdom is here in all of its fullness, it's going to be a king of, kingdom of peace and justice and righteousness throughout the entire kingdom. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is God's will? It's just what we just were talking about. People receiving Christ into their life. That in our life together, we become a community of the king. And we work for those things at the heart of of who God is. That's why this prayer is a disciple's prayer. And it's only on the lips of a disciple that this prayer really takes on meaning. Because we're committing ourselves to Christ as Lord and Savior, as King of our lives, and working for those things at the very heart of who God is. Father, thank you for your word. And I hope that this message on this first part of the Lord's Prayer resonates with the people here and that they can get a greater understanding of what this prayer is about and also what they are praying when they say these words that Jesus taught us. Truly may your spirit speak to our hearts and to our lives so that we can live out what we claim here to be not only your word but your word for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We come to our time of our service where we offer our prayers and several of them have been mentioned here in the congregation this morning. And for those of you at home, if you're watching this and you have some prayer requests, you send them on to the church and we'll be glad to pray for you. So let's come together in a time of prayer as we unite our hearts and come before God's throne. Father, we know that you are the giver of life and all that is good. What we do not always realize is that you want to give us your life and you want us to experience it in all of its abundance. You call us into relationship with yourself and into relationship with other Christians. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come before you and worship, 
to hear your word both for us and for our lives. We thank you that we can sing songs in the company of other Christians and that we can offer our prayers as a part of our time together. We can pray for ourselves. We can pray for our families. We can pray for one another. We can pray for our world. As your people whom you call to be brothers and sisters of Christ, we pray that we can live fully and completely as you would have us live. Help us to grow in compassion and kindness and humility and patience and gentleness and the ability to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. But above all, help us to grow in love, which is the quality that most characterizes yourself. Father, we pray each week the Lord's Prayer, and we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. And you want your will to be done in us and in your church, as well as throughout the world. Open our eyes to understand that you desire for your kingdom to come to maturity in our lives, and that your will is for us to accept Christ as Lord and King, and where we commit ourselves to live as your people each and every day. And I pray that this church can be a reflection of kingdom life. And as people look upon us and come to us and see us, they can get a glimpse of what your kingdom is all about. We thank you for the fellowship we do have with other Christians. May we all see the importance of developing that fellowship as we also develop that sense of community with each other. And as a part of that community, praying is so important. And so we lift up to you this day, these people, and ask that as a congregation, we keep them in our prayers. So we pray for Don, Don. for Debbie, Debbie, for Brian, Brian, for Kathy, Kathy, for Jeff, Jeff, for Sandra, Sandra, for Joni, Joni, for Tennant, Tennant, for Diane, Diane, for Betty, Betty, for David, David, for Kim, Kim, for Jimmy, Jimmy. For Sandy. Sandy. We pray for our families, both as they come to enjoy the holidays and as they travel to us and travel home safely. That certainly is a praise. But just praise you for families and for the love and the sharing that takes place. And as we see prayers that are answered and lives that are touched. You know, as you touch our lives and our living, we pray that we in turn may touch others with your same love and grace. For indeed, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And now we join in that prayer. And I'd like for us to pray this prayer slowly and reflecting upon each phrase as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The holiest Lord has been so good to all of us. The blessings that he has bestowed upon us the life that he gave for us. At this time in our service, we have the opportunity to give back to the Lord for his service. If you are at home and you would like to send offering to help with God's kingdom, you may send the offering. Our website is www bigcovechurch.org For those of you in the church, you may put your offering in the basket in the back.
now that we have received the offerings from your people, we come to you and ask one more thing. Lord, please guide us, guide our hearts, so that we may use these funds to promote your kingdom and to help others to show your love in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our sending song is To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done. We'll sing just two stanzas of this hymn. Let us go forth from this time of worship remembering that we are new creatures in Christ. God has given us his love, he's granted us his forgiveness, and he's renewed our spiritual lives. So let us go in peace. Let us go in love, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And truly know that God is with you all, but he's also within you. Amen. <laughs>